the formal language is put upon us by the power structures. And what slang does is it kind of represents this under power. Is slang necessary for us or is it kind of just something that happens? Like, does this serve a fundamental function? No, it's not necessary, but yes, it does serve a fundamental function for us. So slang is a little bit of a release valve from the constraints of formal language. So uh, the formal language is put upon us by the power structures. Formal language it belongs to the classes that have power, authority, strength, whether that's economic power or educational power or the power of governments, that sort of thing. And what slang does is it kind of represents this under power, the power of, say, people who will one day have power but don't now, or they have the power of fashion or power of trends. So one of the long, I guess long argued maybe isn't quite the right way to phrase it, but long discussed debates in lexicography, which is the art and craft of making dictionaries, and in linguistics is what is slang. And one of the generally understood and agreed upon definitions is that it's this informal expression, kind of a pushback against formal language. And so the reason you need that pushback is you have to take an alternate stance against that power. So yes, it's it, it, humans, uh, we're a resistant people. We, uh, we dislike power. We want it. And when we get it, we abuse it. But we dislike it if we don't have it. And Slang is a way of resisting that power. Do you think most people realize that, though? I don't think they consciously realize it, no. But I think unconsciously they realize it. The way that you, uh, when you're a teenager, or, and it's not just teens who use slang, by the way. We use it our whole lives. But it tends to be a, we tend to be, uh, it's a little old-fashioned when we get older. But the way that you might see you slang in front of your parents, kind of coyly, knowing that you might be slipping something by them, that's a kind of power. Uh, that's a kind of power to say something in front of someone else and and get away with it where they don't quite realize what you're saying i have reached the age now where i kind of don't like certain slang a little bit like oh i need to know what that means it <laughs> old makes man me yells at cloud right i am the old man yelling at the cloud is that kind of a natural reaction that people have then as they get older like oh what what are you saying what does this mean yeah it really is because you you move on to other priorities you're building a career you're building a family you're you're focused on other stuff and when you when you're coming up as a teenager this is when you leave childhood behind and you're not quite a fully fledged adult you're learning what it is to be an adult you have a lot more free time to build those people networks and to, uh, to figure out who you are you spend a lot of time figuring out who you are and the language that you choose is part of that if you listen to the conversation of teenagers you often hear them say things along the lines of i'm the kind of person who and one of those things that follow that phrase could be, I'm the kind of person who says X. You know, I'm the kind of person who uses this language. And so slang is um, about identity as much as, as much as the clothes that you wear, the haircut that you have, or the makeup that you use or don't use, or the posters you put on your wall, or the playlists that you put, you put together on Spotify, that sort of thing. How does that work, though, in the sense where slang could be highly individualized, but also is uniform throughout society? In the sense that to be slang, it has to everybody has to know it, but certain people only use these words. So it, it's about pockets. So, for example, the slang of a high school in Buffalo, New York, is different than the slang of a high school in San Diego, California. They share some language, but they'll have different words. Uh, but their 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 preoccupations are the same. Am I pretty enough? Am I good looking enough? Can I be pop more popular? Right. Well, these are all the same preoccupations. Therefore, they generate the same kind of slang and language. Well, the words that you use for someone of the of a that, that you find romantically appealing, for example, we are always every generation is coming up with new words for this. Every generation, again, and, and the words that mean cool or great or fantastic or excellent, every generation comes up with new words for that. Does slang always start with younger people, or is that just kind of a misconception that people have? It. It mostly is from younger people, but you do get it from people in their 20s and 30s and older as well. But when it's from older groups, it tends to more appear in different kinds of situations that are tied, say, to the workplace. For example, you will have military slang, and that tends to be people who are older in their, say, late teens, early 20s, and even 30s. And this is because of what they're doing together as a profession. 
or you might have sports slang, which again is younger adults uh, outside of their teens or even late teens or early 20s and so forth. So this is slang, but perhaps it's more technically called jargon. Jargon is kind of like slang for the workplace, but it's associated with these tasks that they all need to do together. And it tends to be a little more universal, maybe a lot more universal than, than slang. And it's more about accomplishing these tasks so that you don't have to keep repeating, keep elaborating these phrases. The one that immediately comes to my mind is like the corporate jargon of, I don't have the bandwidth for that. Like that's the one that like, oh God, I'm drives me nuts but just like with slang it tends to be that when you find yourself annoyed by jargon or with slang it's because it's not for you it's not yours and you're annoyed with it it's like trying on somebody else's clothes that don't fit yeah i just had a self-realization when you said that it's like oh that isn't for me like oh no the corporate world is not do we have to adopt these though to some degree Yes, that's a really good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Uh, we do have to adopt these. Otherwise, you find yourself stuck, say, in the, the 1820s, <laughs> refusing to keep up with the language. And you do find that in American culture. For example, some of the uh, very conservative homeschoolers will only use dictionaries that stopped being updated well before the Internet age. And so they're stuck. When we look at slang, though, are yeah. we... Coming up with a fundamentally new ways to identify things like, no, this new slang identifies a new concept in our realities, or are we just coming up with a new name for something that they used to have? Like the immediate example I think of is my seven-year-old says sus, but we just used to call it shady. Like, are these new concepts generally, or is this like, no, nope, you're just, you're just calling it something different. It's a lot of new synonyms for old things that's part of it so yeah sus or shady or sketchy and um yeah lots of words for the old things but there's new stuff uh, representing new ideas a lot of the new technology terms for example i think of some stuff that came out recently when we're talking about girl dinner uh, this idea that young women don't feel like they have to go out and make a big production out of meal whether out of the house or in the house they just simply go to the kitchen pull together a few items that really please them and perhaps they're healthy, perhaps they're not. And that's dinner. You know, they don't have to like elaborately cook for themselves in order to feel like they've accomplished a meal. You know, a few nuts, a few olives, some juice from the refrigerator. That's girl dinner, you know. And it says a lot about their ability to not feel the pressures to perform this meal, you know, that society says you have to have a meal. And there's all this cultural baggage that comes with these two words of girl dinner. And I think uh, some, of the, some of the new language is about that, you know? I think about um, how, how, how blue can I be in your podcast? As far as you want to go. <laughs> I think about a term like big dick energy. Um, you know, they, they all said Anthony Bourdain had big dick energy. You know, this idea that a, a man through his, not just his physical stance, but his personal points of view and the aura that he carries when he walks into a room as, and somebody that you can find believable and, and suspect that the way that he treats the people around him with kindness has big dick energy. So it's not really about his sexual prowess. It's about his, his perspective on the world and the way that he treats others. There's so much more in this term than just those three words. This is something that I don't think we had a synonym before. When you look kind of at it, is there a pattern that words have as they kind of climb the ladder of becoming slang? Is there a pattern like, okay, if this new, like Riz I can think of, is there a pattern that you would look at and say, okay, for these slang words, they're, it's gonna, this is gonna happen, then this is gonna happen, then this is gonna happen? It, it can. Uh, every word has its own story and its own life, and it's, it's not one path, just like people. One, one thing that it's important about slang and I always get asked this, so I'm going to preempt this question in case it's on your list. What makes a word, slang word successful? Because I think that's what's coming up in your mind, is the funny ones don't last. The ones that are jokey or cute or hilarious or that make you giggle at first, they tend not to be the ones that, have, that, that, that last the longest. It's the ones that are a little more boring and have more utility. The ones that fill a linguistic hole or a gap in the language, those are the ones that endure. 
And you might say, well, why is that? It's because the flashy ones burn out faster. They get borrowed more quickly outside of the group that they were created by and for, and more easily abused, of course, by by the press and by advertising and, and show up in movies and in, and in the mouths of people that they don't belong to, or it's clear they're being co-opted by script writers and co-opted by by um, adults who don't really who are using for irony irony or in, in order to make fun of the people that originally said them so it's the the nondescript terms that last the longest and so if i were to say modify your question a little bit and say what is the pathway of a slang term that lasts that's what i would say the ones that are just a little more uh a little more, less visible at first, you know, they kind of sneak up on you. And I think Riz actually was one of those kind of, uh, and I think it actually is already burnt out or is nearly burnt out. It did not last very long. Like how long are they usually around for? Well, there's no time on that, but what we can do is look at the typical adoption curve. And this is something that you will see uh, used again and again in marketing and sales classes. Just Google adoption curve and go to Google Images or wherever, and you will see this hump. And it will show you the early adopters and the late adopters in the middle. And it's exactly the same, more or less, for most slang, where you have the early adopters and the late adopters and most people in the middle. I think the biggest discrepancy here is those people who are convinced that they're early adopters but are actually late adopters. And that's where a lot of this hate and disgruntlement about slang comes in. It's these people who particularly who have platforms like newsletters or newspapers or radio, the people who consider themselves in touch with language and realize as they encounter a new language, they absolutely are not in touch with language and they resent it. And the arrival of new slang that they didn't know about proves it every single day. And it comes out in this uh, dismissal of the language of other people. And the other thing that happens with this dismissal of the language of other people, it's a, it's a proxy for other biases. And in this particular case, it's a, it's a generational bias. It's a ageism or elitism or classism. But there's a, sometimes it's racism and genderism and sexism. But the, it's a, this kind of dismissal of the language of other people is just a way to hide your biases and claim that there's something fundamentally wrong with that kind of language. But really what it is is about you as the speaker having a bias against the people who use that language. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Is is slang unique or special in English in any way? No, every every language that I've ever studied has this kind of informal language that has this this register to it that kind of talks back to the formal language. And by talk back I mean in the sassy sense of talking back. Is there discrimination over it? Oh, yeah, some... 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Tons of bias against against slang. Uh, partly because some people misunderstand what slang is. Some think it's all dirty words, all the four-letter words, all the naughty stuff, and that's not true. Uh, the, the naughty words, as a matter of fact, many of them are not even slang. They're part of the standard dialect, part of standard English. The F word, the S word, and so forth, those are standard English. Those aren't slang. And people don't understand that. Uh, because they're old, <laughs> they're some of the oldest words in English. As a matter of fact, there doesn't seem to be, at least from my mind, a lot of slang words for cuss words. Like, no, you just use the cuss word. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of there. There are a lot of words for fornicating, <laughs> and there are a lot of words for caca. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of words, <laughs> a lot of words for derriere. And as a matter of fact, the the night that my wife and I became a couple, we were at a bar with a bunch of people, linguists and lexicographers. As a matter of fact, coming up with synonyms for the word "butt" for derriere. So that was an important moment in my life. And can you trace any of the words back to like one person? Occasionally, we can. You're talking about etymology. Like it's it's rare though. Most of the fun stories you know about word origins are either invented or unverifiable. But yeah, occasionally, yeah. Particularly the eponyms. Which was the words that are named after a person. Does the, do the does a slang word usually go through different iterations before it hits mainstream? Yeah, often because their slang is often orally transmitted first, kind of like a, you know, kind of like mono. Uh, so it <laughs> goes person to person without ever reaching paper and oral transmission is very weak transmission. It just is not effective. It 
it loses a lot. It's like the the telephone game if you've ever played that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at a party where the it doesn't take very many people before it loses some of its value. It becomes saturated, or sorry, desaturated. It loses a lot of detail, bleached of meaning and and value. So yeah, but what once it reaches paper and starts to be a little more established, then the meaning becomes more firm and more fixed. Can you think? I know it's putting you in a spot a little bit. Can you think of an example off the top of your head that kind of speaks to that? Yeah, actually, a really good example, one that I find kind of irritating. Um, I do get irritated about language sometimes. Is the lowdown and the lowdown. So, in some parts of the society, people think that uh, to be on the lowdown only means that you're gay on the side, that you're in the closet, particularly in the African American community. But it for but it. Long has only long has meant to be anything on the on the side to be hiding who you really are to be like say a criminal on the lowdown or to have a, another family on the lowdown. But some people swear up and down that it only means that you're gay um, on the side without um, you know that you have a gay lover on the side without your family knowing. So it's one of those things where the meeting even now still isn't fully settled and people just can't accept that there might be more than one meeting. Are there words, though, slang words that would say, okay, in this group it means this, in this group it means something completely yes, different? Yes, uh, to be out of pocket. Oh. So let me ask you, Nick, what does out of pocket mean to you? Two things. In the business world, it means that you're not going to be able to like respond quickly to emails and questions and things like that. And then to be out of pocket, pocket more in like, I don't know, the social world would mean... I think of it as being not knowing what's going on. Yeah, there's there's three. So, so there's the business sense, uh, which means to be unavailable. But there's another business sense, which means you might be paying for things out of pocket. And then when you get back to the office, you will reconcile with your receipts and stuff. And those are related. But the second sense that you were talking about is usually more defined as to be wild and unmanageable. And this comes from African-American English. Uh, and that is the sense that most white Americans don't know or they're surprised to hear. Are there areas of the country and we're, you know, we have an international audience, but primarily in the United States. <laughs> where, are there areas of the country that you would say, oh, they have the most, they have the most unique slang or they use the most slang versus places that like, that's not really a slang place. Uh, no, everyone's got their thing. The question is, which variety has been most lifted up as ordinary? And by that, I mean, we, every culture promotes one of its dialects as the prestige dialect. And in our country, we have promoted, at least more recently, this kind of what we call standard American, which is more or less a generic Midwestern dialect, kind of the news, news, newscaster dialect as the standard American prestige dialect. And if you have this dialect, you're considered average and normal. It wasn't always the case. It used to be this East Coast dialect that sounded a little bit more like a, a Boston Brahmin or a New Yorker with this almost uh, mid-Atlantic pronunciation of the R. It's kind of a almost snotty kind of Harvard Yale kind of sound. Um, that, that changed at some point. So let me ask you, when you drive down the road and you see a VW bug with one he headlight, what do you, do you say something? I immediately think slug bug. You don't say, you don't say punch bug or padiddle? No, slug bug. Okay, Maybe so, punch buggy, but slug bug is the one that I okay. go with. Yeah. What do you, what do you call those little crustaceans that uh, appear in ditches and creeks that make these little mud holes? Crawdads. Uh, not crayfish? Mud bugs? No. So there's all these different dialects. So we may be one country. We may most of us speak English and all of us spend the dollar. But we are not a monolithic country that speaks one language. And we have never been. Then there's never been one English. So I guess what I'm getting at to answer your original question is uh, everybody has really interesting language and really interesting slang. And there's no one place that does it. All it takes is a little bit of field work. I can ask... Anybody in this country who's lived here for a while, a handful of questions, and we'll pretty soon get to something interesting. What do you call it when you give another kid a ride on your handlebars? Oh, I don't, I don't even have a word for it. Some people call it pumping. That doesn't make any sense to me. That, that's fine. That's, it doesn't have to make sense to you. It makes sense to them. <laughs>
I wouldn't have realized that, that there is kind of a unique local slang for everything. Let me ask you this, Nick. When you were in school and another kid got in trouble in classroom, in the classroom, and he had to go to the office, and the teacher sent this kid to the office, was there a noise that everyone in the classroom made together? Like an ooh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do the noise for me. Ooh? Well, in part of the country, they go... All the or um the why is that just that's just how that happened huh I don't know but uh, it's in the southwest and up through the Rocky Mountains and actually in part of Vermont strangely so this is what I'm saying it doesn't take very long when you start talking to people about this stuff it goes far beyond uh, Coke versus pop and pops versus soda it goes far beyond that before you get to the bottom of this stuff and you start to realize, okay, we could be here all day talking about this stuff. Slang word that took you the longest to figure out what it meant. Yeah, this isn't slang so much as dialect. Um, It's a phrase called to who laid the rail. T-O space W-H-O space L-A-I-D space R-A-I-L. And basically what it means, so like I would say... um, Nick really ate that pie to who laid the rail. I don't have a clue. It just means you did it with a lot of force. You just did it with all your energy and all your might. Now I kind of get it. <laughs> but, I, but I was like, eh, I must have worked hours and hours on that. I had to dig in the historical record for ages and ages. It just it's still, it's like a strangest construction though, isn't it? To who laid the rail. Is slang though usually a shortened firm form, or does it not always become no, it like can the be. long way to say it? Right, yeah, the, it's a misunderstanding of language to think that humans always seek the shortest form. They don't. They absolutely do not. At the same time, we're shortening things; we're often lengthening it. Uh, it's we do not necessarily seek the seek the short form. We're not looking for efficiency; we're looking for clarity, and clarity sometimes requires a longer form. Is there a pattern to Gen Z slang? Is there a pattern at all to the current slang that we have? All of their stuff seems to be about taking the surface that they've been given and make it work. And by that, I mean the surface being all these commercial tools they've been given, all these commercial systems they've been given, all this commerce that is plastered around them. They, they take it as given and then try to subvert it within its own parameters. They accept the framework. And so I think some of their language is about that as well. They accept the framework of the language they're given. Um, so sure, there's a ton of TikTok slang, tons of it, but it's all within the framework of TikTok. It doesn't really leave TikTok. It's very specific to the thing that they are Yeah, doing. Yeah, it's specific to that universe. If TikTok failed tomorrow, that language would go poof. It doesn't have much residue outside TikTok. It's um, it's walled gardens where all is it, all, all it's going to take is for one storm for that, that garden to go poof. And it, it will have left nothing, no impact upon the language as a whole. Almost none. Can you think of a word that would be like a good example of that? No. I mean, I think I used Girl Dinner, which actually did come up on TikTok and did escape. But I think it was because I feel like the words that do escape are plucked from TikTok rather than escape TikTok, if that makes sense. It's like people who monitor TikTok for a language see stuff and talk about it as a TikTok phenomenon. It's not that it accidentally leaves TikTok and shows up in the outside world and people go, whoa, where did this come from? And it turns out it was from TikTok. I don't know. I, I might be too cynical on this, but I, I just it's in contrast to the way it was when I was coming up. That's all. I'm not saying our way was better. But uh, I it just there's less of the DIY um, do it yourself, break the systems and then make new ones. They are accept, accepting the systems and then trying to make it work their way. It's different. Let's do the easy ones, right? What is your personal favorite slang word? I don't know. I mean, what are you going to do with this answer when you get it? That's my question back at you. I always find it fascinating to th- know what somebody who really knows about something thinks is the best. Because to me, that's kind of like knowing like the inside track. Like, who do the people who play in the NFL really think is the best player? Not the person that the media analysts push forward. So I always think of it as being like, what's the interesting 
Like, what do the people who really know think? All right. Um, there's a term, it's, I don't know how slangy it is, but there's a term that I came across in an old newspaper once that I'm fond of, and it's uh, one politician called another one a revolving bastard because he was a son of a bitch no matter which way you looked at him. <laughs> God, that is good. That is good. There is something about the combination of certain words that's just like, oh, I know exactly. I've never heard that combination before, but I know yeah, yeah. what that person is. Like, oh, well, yeah. But it's also because the guy making the insult sets himself up for the punchline, right? You can just see him deliciously writing himself up. So he del he's his own straight man. And just... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, just, it's covered from every angle. Right. Is there one, though, that lexicographers and people such as yourself would say, like, that's the best one of all time? That is the Michael Jordan, LeBron. I will say, I don't know about favorite, but the fact that cool has lasted so long to mean great and good is a remarkable thing. And even during this whole time, hot has undergone some transform transformations, you know, hot has developed new meanings and other things. But cool to mean like, you know, he's a cool dude that still exists but it's still slangy it's not really standard yet if it ever will be that's an amazing thing when so many other words have burnt out in the same amount of time why hasn't why why is cool stayed utility absolute utility again utterly ordinary word but absolute utility that's what you need in a slang word any word actually it just needs to be useful and not altogether flashy can you look at an age bracket and say, okay, by the time this word hits this age bracket, it's over? No, it's not about age brackets. It's I always say that once it appears in an ad on the side of a bus, it's done. It's done. <laughs> once I hear it in a commercial, it's done. I remember when I saw bling literally on the side of a bus in New York City. I'm like, oh, yeah, that word's over. <laughs> That's done. Yeah. Finished. Shows up in Newsweek, finished, over, done. Oh, what do you think is the next big one? That's a fool's game. Predicting anything in language is a fool's game. That's pretty much all the questions that I have. If somebody wants to learn more, where can they find you? Where can they catch the show? That kind of stuff. Yeah, the best place to find out more of the kind of stuff I was talking about, the language things that I was sharing, is to go to my radio show. It's called Away With Words. You can find it on any podcast app and at our website at waywardradio.org. Or you can go to my website at grantbarrett.com, two R's, two T's, dot org. I'll take you there, too. I have that domain also.